Pacers president of basketball operations, Kevin Pritchard, speaks his first media availability since the trade deadline, I believe. And I was there. Uh, I will break down everything he said, what was asked, what it means, cut through some of it, sorting it into buckets of the team's new directional path, some comments on players, and some just general thoughts on the team. We'll talk about it all today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And today, the big news thing, big news thing, big event took place for the first time of the offseason, a front office event. We had a front office reception for media members uh, on Thursday. So Kevin Pritchard spoke to the media for the first time publicly since I believe uh, the trade deadline. I don't remember. Uh, he did not do an exit interview. Rick Carlisle did. So it was obviously huge news. Anytime Kevin Pritchard speaks, we get to hear more from the front office. We'll talk about some of his comments today. I have grouped them into three groups. One is what I consider to be the thesis of the day and the way he was talking and the way the team's messaging is being displayed. Number two is sort of updates or what he had to say about some of the Pacers' moves, Miles Turner, DeAndre Ayton, Jalen Smith, for example. I wanted to ask about Brogdon, but yeah, we don't have unlimited time. 25 minutes is a long time for him to just do a Q&A. Uh, and three, general stuff I thought was noteworthy. I typed down a lot of stuff because, again, every time the president speaks, it's a big deal. Kevin Pritchard listens, speaks. <laughs> Kevin Pritchard speaks. We all listen. So Pritchard spoke today for about 25 minutes. Much appreciated to him. For the time, uh, and to me, the big kind of takeaway is the Pacers kind of, look, I think this this has been known, to, before I say this, this has been known, uh, but the Pacers now have a newfound interest in not being a team that manages in the middle, was the phrasing he used, right? And we started to get hints of this around the trade deadline when he addressed comments he's made in the past about, you know, he, he would say when they would add certain players or when they would hire certain people or go a certain way that the Pacers wanted to be a tough out. They wanted to, to make the playoffs and be tough to beat or maybe make the second round and then grow from there. And they had a team that was already a first round lock for a little bit there and then tapered off. So I get why they were thinking, OK, let's get a little better. Let's be like that. But the tough out quote never rang right with fans. And I think he addressed that at the trade deadline. But I think that that as the front office has kind of addressed how they want to proceed. You know, the Pacers of old, in fact, the Pacers for decades have not been a team that doesn't do that. They've done very well. And Herb Simon was right. He said this last year. They've done very well at, at staying good and then making moves to go from one era to the next while remaining good. The Oladipo trade, right? Basically outside of the brawl, right? The whole Reggie era, they found ways to move pieces around to continue to be a good team from the early 90s to mid-2000s when the brawl happened, right? They pivoted from the late Granger era into the PG era into the Vic era pretty seamlessly with good teams, right? They have done it with different GMs as well. You know, Donnie Walsh, Larry Bird, Kevin Pritchard, in a way so often that I understand why Herb Simon says, yes, we can be a team that continues to be good and then just transitions from one era to the next. But that's not really how the NBA works anymore, especially from a ceiling perspective because not only is that – maybe you can pull off that strategy forever and ever, but you will have a capped ceiling a lot of the time, right? Even their best teams were conference finals teams. They made the finals once in this whole span of time that I have just discussed. And so all of this background to say what they've done has been noble, certainly. And he even addressed that with the – you know, uh, they've made the playoffs quite often in their history. But he said in the past it's been we've got to go down this path. There's a ceiling, and he wants to remove the ceiling. And by go down this path, he means continue to reach the playoffs and continue to be that kind of team. I don't think they want to be that anymore. And I think that, you know, the actions speak louder than words. In every case, for every front office in the NBA, they can go in front of whoever or on the radio or, or write whatever and say this or that. But what they do is the easiest way to interpret what they're saying. And the Pacers clearly, I think, last February, started to realize that they needed to think a little differently in terms of how they manage team building. And so trading away vets to intentionally be 
a worse team, and then in an offseason prioritizing adding picks and young players instead of vets to be good. Like even when they traded for Vic and Domas, who were 25 and 21, 22 at the time, it could have been very easy for them to sign young players. Even if Vic and Domas were as good as they were, they would have been an okay team. But they signed guys like Darren Collison, Bayang Bogdanovich, Al Jefferson. I think that was the year before. Either way, right? They clear Corey Joseph, that was the other one. They made moves to bring in veteran pieces, right? They wanted to be competitive. They did not do that this summer. And I think that is sort of my biggest takeaway from the way he was talking. They got the, the front office, you know, got on the same page. They aligned whatever word you want to use for that. And they don't want to be that team anymore that thinks sort of not quite year to year, but close to it. And he even described it similarly, um, but thinking more long-term and more about the ceiling of your team and how that is the sell for the community, for the fans, and even for the franchise and the players and things like that. You are, you are selling a better product when you're saying we are building for a higher ceiling than just being this playoff team year over year, being a tough out. And I think that is a big mindset mindset shift. You know, a lot of the times when I talk about the Pacers on this show or on interviews, I say, yeah, I think that what, what they should do or what makes a lot of sense is XYZ rebuilding move. But then I also had the caveat, but given what we know of the Pacers for 30 years, you know, and that's important. Since Simon owned the team, we have a pattern of how the Pacers are run and what their goals are. And Herb Simon still owns the team. But I do think there's been some sort of paradigm shift, and he has to be involved in this and understand everything. He is the the decision maker when it's all said and done, but I think he understands that the ceiling part of this is important, and I think the front office has done a good job getting everybody on board with that and moving forward. Now, to that point, what are the Pacers right now? How are they not managing in the middle? They are building the team that they have that's young, and it's a project. They would like to have a core and build with it. And he had some interesting comments about the core, right? He said, we're developing a core. And he said, people ask me, do you have a core? Maybe, probably not, right? So in his eyes, yeah, they have some pieces that might be a part of their core, but maybe not the whole core yet. And he hates the word rebuild to describe what the Pacers are doing. And I understand why that word still makes sense. I will continue to use it because they went from one era to another era, literally, seven, eight months ago. It's still been within a year, right? One year ago today, we were talking about how Rick Carlisle can get the Pacers to gel and back into the postseason, right? Like it's a re-changing of what the Pacers are, but he prefers just normal build because he likes the core that he does have in place. Does Does he know what all those pieces are? Does he think it's a finished product? Absolutely not. Kevin Pritchard does not think that way ever, but he does see uh, more of a build here because they have young pieces in place. He did add to that, though. It's going to take some time. And I think that is something that, you know, you haven't really heard from the Pacers. They, as they thought more year to year or reach the postseason, be good in the past, it wasn't really a, and Chad Buchanan said this, at the golf outing yesterday on the radio, you know, they are thinking this is going to be a little longer term thing. And that is a new shift for the Pacers hearing it from the president. It always matters. And it starts from the top, right? Herb Simon, Kevin Pritchard, getting everybody there uh, is a big deal. And something else Kevin Pritchard said to this point is they wanted to look at their team and their strategy in wider increments was the term he used. And that was interesting, too. And I've sort of addressed this already in in talking for eight minutes now. But, you know, in the past, the way he described it is they've 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 looked ahead in one to two year increments. Okay, if we do we sign Tyreek Evans, you know, for example, that was a one year contract that fits this to a T. But like that addresses our secondary creation with Vic or and, you know, Darren Carlson and Bogdanovich, two-year deals. Like, they can bridge us through the playoffs for the next couple of years. Right? Like, you could do this for forever. And so the, the thing that breaks it up a little bit is the, you know, Brogdon, TJ Warren, Jeremy Lamb, uh, Summer, Kyle Quinn in that time. Uh, but even then, right, they were hoping to reach the playoffs. And then they regrouped in two years and they traded Vic. And like, it, it all sort of has been that way in the KP era. And I think they want to look at it in three to four-year increments instead of like, okay, this is our core. Let's get the right pieces for this core in that amount of time to be the team that we want to be and reach the ceiling that we want to achieve. So in general, and he's right to say this, I'm glad he added this to his quote, you know, that sort of thinking longer term skews younger, it skews asset accumulation, it skews flexibility, and it skews longer term thinking, right? Like the Lakers are technically thinking long term, they have LeBron James under contract for four years, but like, it's a more urgent thing, you know? So but in general, they're thinking longer term now in three to four year swaths instead of shorter groups. And that's why their optionality 
is such a valuable asset to this team, having that space, having flexibility with their roster spots. That's why they want to add more picks. That's why they've been in the rumors with the Lakers for forever. And that is why the Pacers are now going to be a team that does not, as Pritchard said, uh, manage in the middle. They want to take this a, d- a different sort of way. And I think that that is a good message from the franchise to fans. One, and two, I think that that, it, you know, maybe it, it can depend on who the fan is. But I think more fans prefer that to what they were doing. So overall, I really enjoyed hearing his thoughts on that, how the team has sort of talked to get to this point. And now they're headed down a new path, a path that we have not seen the Pacers embark on in a very long time. Segment two here, I want to talk about what he said about players. This has become sort of locked on Miles Turner this week. He's going to be in a segment, our whole show, in three of the five shows this week. But he is a big subject for this team right now. So uh, I he was asked about Miles Turner, uh, Kevin Pritchard was. I asked him about DeAndre Ayton, obviously that saga. This is the first time he's spoken publicly since then. Uh, and he also talked about Jalen Smith, that re-signing uh, that happened so long ago. It's sort of been swept under the rug, but was a monumental thing for the Pacers to be able to bring him back, especially on the contract that they did. Let's talk about what Kevin Pritchard had to say about those moves and about what it meant for the Pacers' summer really quickly. Before we talk about that, I want to talk to you guys about BetOnline.net, your number one source for all of your football betting info this season. You can find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles, plus analysis on every game you can find all over at BetOnline.net. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information. For example, if you're getting ready for the weekend like me, Colts Chiefs here in Indy, home opener for the Colts. Colts uh, predicted to lose, so the Chiefs are favored, by five and a half. Given how the Colts have played, I'm surprised it's that low. We will see my lovely Hoosiers, 3-0, and the worst 3-0 and football team ever. Going to Cincinnati, uh, the Bearcats are favored by 16 and a half. Either way, you can get these lines over at betonline.net, the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events. They've got up-to-the-minute scores for everything out there. Plus, they have MLB lines, M- MMA. Boxing, golf, NBA soon to come. So head over to betonline.net, check all this out, or use your mobile device to learn more about all this because Bet Online is where the game starts. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. By golly, this is easy. Locked On Celtics. John Krause will break down the huge news in Boston about Ime Udoka breaking franchise rules and protocols inappropriate relationship with another team member and he's suspended now it's been announced by the Celtics about an hour ago for me talking no Ime Udoka coaching the Celtics for this entire season uh John Krause will have all that biggest news in the NBA by a mile right now although Robert Sarver right behind if you want to listen to Locked On Suns hey let's talk about Kevin Pritchard and the Pacers though this is Locked On Pacers in this segment I was titling the segments for this show I just typed player stuff because it's sort of scatterbrained, and it turns out I could have typed center stuff because all the stuff we asked about was about centers. I had a list of questions I wanted to ask potentially about the Brogdon trade, a couple other things regarding the salary floor, but uh, again, limited timing, and I appreciate Kevin Pritchard giving us any time. Uh, Some GMs barely talk or don't talk at all to the media. Uh, The Knicks, for example, are one of those teams. The Thunder only get about two Sam Prestes a year. Kevin Pritchard, eh, not to dump on those teams just for context Kevin Pritchard speaks to us more than that at least and I appreciate any time we can get that said there were like eight of us so uh anywho Kevin Pritchard did talk about three particular players and things that happened this summer I would like to shed some light on those first up obviously Miles Turner is the big one obviously he was in the obviously 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 uh he was in the news yesterday with Chad Buchanan uh answering a question from Kevin Bowen on 1075 the fan about his future with the team confirming yes opening night roster Miles Turner starting center kaboom we knew that already, but now Kevin Pritchard adding more context there. And before we talk about that, something the Pacers have always done for all of time, and this is a big part of the Pritchard Buchanan front office, is tell players when they're in talks ahead of time, before they find out via another medium, via a report, via an actual trade, that they've been dealt. Kevin Pritchard himself mentioned this today. He, when he was a player in the NBA, he was traded from the Vancouver Grizzlies, throw back to the Vancouver Grizzlies, to the Orlando Magic. He found out via the media that that was happening, right? That sucks for every player. These are humans. Like, that is something that for Kevin Pritchard is very hard. I think he even said today, a lot of times w- with trades, they want to be really sure when they're doing them because, you know, if it's a closer to 50 50 thing, maybe you don't want to do it for the human element part. Anywho, all that to say, uh, you know, they're, they're very open with these players. So he had 
what he described as an hour and a half conversation with Miles Turner very recently. Obviously, his situation, uh, you know, they tried to sign DeAndre Ayton, and he's been in trade rumors with several teams for all of time, but specifically the Lakers for all this time, you know. So getting on, I, I think Miles Turner is truly bought into the Pacers. I always think he's been bought into the Pacers. He tweeted about the Pacers sort of <laughs> cryptically via emojis yesterday, right? I don't think he is in a bad headspace, but I understand why he could come in and go, eh, no, you know, you know, this this is not the perfect situation for me. Kevin Pritchard said, quote, about Miles, he wants to play with Tyrese. He wants to play exclusively at the five. He wants to be a defensive monster. And I think he'd be open to having some deep roots here, but he'll be a free agent next year. So, uh, uh, look, Miles not being a distraction is obviously the key part of that, even if he does want to be a free agent next year, which he'll be an unrestricted free agent for the first time. That is a very big deal. But in general, I think Miles is handling this very well from a player perspective, like the Pacers actively tried to sign a player to start at his position that obviously will will affect any player, or at least think about it. Uh, something on their mind. And we'll, of course, get to talk to Miles at Media Day next week. But in general, I think that that is uh, pretty noteworthy now. Kevin Pritchard was asked by Greg Doyle directly, hey, if you talked with Miles Turner about an extension, Kevin Pritchard said, uh, I won't comment on that. Uh, I would like to go back to the quote he gave us a second ago, though, where Kevin Pritchard said he's going to be a free agent next year. Uh, if Miles Turner was going to sign an extension, he would not be a free agent next year. I think we can read between the lines a little bit there that maybe that's not something Turner and the Pacers, uh, and likely Turner specifically, are exploring right now. And I get why he would be want to be an unrestricted free agent. So as of now, I think that you know Turner, Pacers on the same page will open the season together, but expect to open up the Miles Turner can of worms. Again, when trade talks heat up mid-December, mid-January, uh, because he'll likely be on an expiring deal at that time and be a valuable player around the NBA. So this will drag on, but finally, after this becoming locked on, Miles Turner for the week. That is everything I have on him at this time. So good clarity from Kevin Pritchard. And I like the anecdote when he shared about him himself being traded from Vancouver to Orlando. DeAndre Ayton! Big, I mean, that is just... Look, looking back, that is just such a different – that that is sort of another thing I should have talked about in the first segment with the different Pacers thinking more long-term, changing the way they view managing a team and ceilings and things like that. Going after Aiden certainly also suggested the paradigm shift that you sort of saw begin in February. I asked him about Aiden and sort of the, the emotions behind it and all that stuff that went on for the team that, you know, lost out on a key negotiation. And, you know, Kevin Pritchard said, I think my message would be – we're not stodgy Pacers anymore. Yes, I think offering four for 130-something is no longer a stodgy thing. Uh, that's not like a monumental contract in the modern NBA, but that is not something the Pacers have even sniffed in the past. Like Brogdon signing four for 84 was like a lot of money for the Pacers and what they have done in the past. They're obviously going to sign Tyrese Halbert to a monster deal uh, within the next year or two, but you know, th- that being not stodgy Pacers is kind of important to negotiate with uh, Tyrese Halbert. So, uh, yeah, that's a big takeaway that they were even willing to do it, even though they thought, as he kind of confirmed, they they put low odds on, you know, he said, when we decided to do that, we handicapped it. They didn't think they would get, uh, you know, they didn't think they had a good shot at Aiden, excuse me. Not that they wouldn't get it. They didn't think they had a good shot at him. Uh, the reference he made is the dumb and dumber quote of, so you're saying there's a chance, right? So the Pacers did want to get Aiden. They didn't want to be the stodgy Pacers. They're willing to spend for young players who fit their, more longer-term, high-ceiling timeline, especially one that fits very well with a guy like Tyrese Halberton, who's been playing well, as he described, in summer practices. But, of course, obviously, they did not expect high odds on that. It didn't cost them a ton on the opportunity cost. No DeAndre in there. So, again, appreciated more thoughts from him uh, on that. Nothing too specific about that, but still interesting. And, of course, he wanted it to happen, but it didn't. The last th- player we got some stuff on, and this one is a little less uh, exciting was Jalen Smith, obviously a uh, big deal that he re-signed for the contract he signed for. I haven't talked about this one in forever because so much has happened since, but remember Jalen Smith, there are a lot of limitations on the money. The Pacers were able to sign him to right? Other teams could offer him more. Uh, and he ends up re-signing with the Pacers with those limitations. So the thought was that he took a one-year deal with a player option because he could get back on the market next year. Uh, ended up being a two-year deal with a player option. So the Pacers now have him for the next two seasons on, what his rookie skill contract would have been. They'll have his full bird rights at the end if they want to pay him again after that. But that was a huge deal to be able to get him on, a, on an undervalued contract given how he played for them uh, and given that other teams presumably would have interest in a former top 10 pick who really closed the season strong. Uh, anyway, all of that background to say Kevin Pritchard 
give a lot of credit to Rick Carlisle there uh, on the recruiting side of that, on the on the general push to get him and bring him back. Uh, and and the recruiting was necessary because the money was going to be tight like that. They had to you know make him feel like he was very welcome here. And he credited Rick a lot. I think Alex Golden tweeted out the picture of you know, Jalen at at a meal with Rick uh, this offseason. That was a very big deal. And he said, quote, we thought that was a 10% chance that they would keep Jalen Smith. That's how significant that is, right? And I I thought it was probably, I I guess I gave it a little higher odds than that, but not much. You know, that was a a Hail Mary almost kind of move that they were able to get him, especially on the contract that they got him on. Not even crippling, yet still a talented young player fits their timeline. And that's just a slam dunk move from the front office. And they got him. So credit to Carlisle for that recruiting pitch, which I think is interesting. And he said he's been looking good in the practices that they've had so far. Speaking of, he did speak about the team. Some general stuff. Segment one, I titled my thesis. Segment two, I titled player stuff. Segment three is just general stuff I thought was noteworthy from Kevin Pritchard. Because again, when you talk for 25 minutes, I have thoughts about what you have to say. Let's talk about the last group of things I want to share with you from Kevin Pritchard's presser that was earlier today. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you guys about Acre Pro when it comes to land sales. It pays to have experts in your corner. Acre Pro Midwest Farm Group are your local farmland specialists. With decades of experience in Indiana agriculture, no one knows the market better. Whether you're doing a 1031 exchange, expanding your operations, selling a row crop farm, your local Acre Pro agent will walk you through all the land and ensure a deal is done right. Great service, just the beginning. Acre Pro provides unparalleled land data, including soil ratings, elevation, flood zones, and land valuation across parcels, so you can get the full picture up front and be confident in the entire land market. Your agent will cater to each of your individual needs and will help you navigate the complexities of buying and selling land. So the process is made simple. Experience the ease of Acre Pro by working with farmland specialists like Kyle Rule, Brady Hammond, Neil Hurt, and Kyle Spray. Visit acrepro.com or call 765 587 3185 and talk to your local land expert today. Again, acrepro.com or call 765-587-3185. Thank you as always for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, Locked On Pistons. The Pistons now have ex-Pacer Bojan Bogdanovich. What a trade that is. That's very surprising. They're going to be fun. Kate Cunningham and stuff. That's a fun team. Today's episode Brought to you by Bet Online, who we talked about earlier. Bet Online's got you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline.net. That's where the game starts. Let's talk about the last things that I had typed down that I thought were interesting from what Kevin Pritchard had to say today. As we talked to talk to him for the first time since the trade deadline. Uh, generally talking about the team. This question from Evan Sidery of Basketball News. Uh, a word he would use to describe the team and their energy. He's giddy. He's giddy about the team and their energy. Watching them has been super fun and and it's sort of a different style. They're more athletic. I think the, the, I've talked about this a lot on the show, but something Rick Carlisle said is, you know, in the past they've been last in the league in dunks. They don't want to be that anymore. I think this younger athletic team is fun for the front office to watch, even if they won't necessarily be a winner this year. And he even mentioned, Kevin Pritchard said, that they feel fast, you know, and that's sort of a consequence of having young legs and young players on the team, but they feel fast watching them. And I think that's going to be at least sort of part of the Pacers' identity this season, uh, when he's been watching them in these pickup games or you know, whatever he you you called what they're doing right now before training camp, something he's talked about with their style is there's a lot of quick reads, right? They they drive in the lane and they move it and then they move it three more times before the shot comes and they're getting you know the looks that they want would be the more efficient shots, corner threes, free throws, layups, things like that. Uh, a lot of quick reads leading to those good shots, and that's in general what you want your offensive style to be. Theoretically, that's the hardest thing to defend. If every team could do it, they would. Not every team can. But you know, he he, he talked about how he thinks that that style and that general you know drive, quick read, make stuff happen fits pretty well with not just Tyrese Halliburton, who of course is. The, the gem of the franchise right now, but also TJ McConnell has looked good in that setting uh, in the, in the um, sort of games and, and scrimmages that they've had so far. So that's sort of his impressions watching the team so far, a little more athleticism, right? Talked about how he even mentioned to Chad Buchanan, like they had two alley-oops in a full season a couple years ago. They have that like 10 per possession. It feels like <laughs> in the practices now. So you get definitely get to see a different type of pacers uh, this year. Some general thoughts on team building. I typed down that I thought were noteworthy. Uh, from Kevin Pritchard. And I think the reason these are noteworthy is, look, they're aligned on this longer-term approach. They have a new coach that they brought in who's also aligned on this approach and is going to be in a new teaching mindset instead of a winning mindset, whatever you want to say about Rick Carlisle and stuff. They're all aligned now. They all have this vision. And part of that, the players they want to bring in is, one, 
they want to get more athletic, which they did, uh, and they want to balance that athleticism with shooting. And I think that is sort of how, if you look at players that may be available in trades in the future or as free agents or in the draft, if you can be athletic and be a shooter, the Pacers will have interest in you and how you will fit with what they're trying to do with the team that they have. Hey, look, the sixth overall pick that they just got. <laughs> athletic and can shoot. Looks more like Andrew Nembard will be the shooter type, if either of those, and looks more like Kendall Brown will be the athletic type. If you're both, generally you're a first-round pick. But either way, you can see that in the additions that they have. They clearly believe Jalen Smith can be one or both. You know, He shot well at times last this past season, and we will see where that shakes out for him, right? You can kind of break this down with a lot of their acquisitions this summer. Aaron Neesmith, the shooter type, right? A lot of it fits into that bucket, and I think that is noteworthy and something they'll have to talk about uh, when they make their decisions in the future, whether, again, that's trade signings, draft picks. Keep those traits in mind. Athletes, shooters, and, and in general, IQ or feel for the game kind of stuff. And they'll be trying to, as they team build, capitalize uh, using their cap space for picks and young players, which naturally that's how you use your space. You rent it out for other money and then take on something with it. They'll have to reach the salary floor. Like they're going to make trades this season. Like it's a lock. It's not It's not going to be a, pay, a, a dry pacer season of trades, even though they would like to have a lot of sticking togetherness. They have to. They have to get to the floor somehow. Miles Turner's on an expiring deal. You know, they, 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 There's going to be trades for the Pacers this year. And so I think they would like to get assets out of that. And obviously they want to get assets in trades, but I think using their space to do that will allow them to get the player types they want and get more sort of general things that they like. And then some other general slash direction comments from KP that I typed down. I didn't really have a good bucket to put those in like I did with the first groups of comments. One is that core comment I typed earlier. I thought that was noteworthy. You know, we talked about developing a young core. When people ask him about the young core, he says, do you have a young core? Maybe, probably not. You know, I think he feels like, and I think that this is correct, they need to get more younger players to have a young core, right? They have pieces in place. Chris Duarte, Isaiah Jackson, Tyrese Hubbard, Benedict Matherin. Is that enough for a, a whole young core? Maybe, but maybe not. And that's why he said maybe. So we'll see if any of those guys can prove they're a part of it alongside Tyrese and what that will look like or if they need to add more to it. Something I asked him about, which I thought I really enjoyed this answer, you know, back at the trade deadline, this has been talked about a lot by me on this show. When Kevin Pritchard was talking about the Pacers trading away Laverne and trading away Sabonis and even Torrey Craig to a lesser extent and getting younger and all those trades was, you know, the Pacers are a boat in the water and you can go any direction on a boat in the water. Uh, and that was a big thing for them as they prioritize flexibility, optionality, they're a boat and they're, they're, they're going the direction they're going, and they can change it very easily. So I, I asked them, you know, hey, uh, you, you likened yourselves to the boat. What direction is the boat heading? You know, how do you, what would you describe the direction of the Pacers as right now? And he said, you know, after the trade deadline, or in general a lot of the times last season, they were an aircraft carrier, a big boat. It takes a really long time and a lot of effort to turn it the direction you want to go. But now, after making a lot of the moves to do the turning, and to getting the pieces they want, and to getting more organizational alignment on longer-term projects, hey, they're now a smaller little you know, speedboat, more flexible, easier to change the directions, can move at the speed you want. So I thought that was interesting. I'll probably stop asking him boat-related questions, but I think that is revealing in the way they felt about this process. Kind of painful, rip the Band-Aid off, slow, ugh, you know, our last team we built didn't work. Let's take the longer approach, because we can go more directions with the setup that we currently have. Uh, he mentioned this once as well. Though. He mentioned the Grizzlies uh, and and how they'll be a team, for example, the Pacers may have to compete with for free agents in the future because they have a young, awesome team that, that has cool vibes that players would want to join. He let, he said that would be a good way for the Pacers to you know, have success in their team building process. And in general, I think the Memphis blueprint is one the Pacers would like to follow. Uh, someone asked Kevin Pritchard, I think it was Wilson Moore uh, of the Indy Star, what would success look like for the Pacers this year? Uh, and this is the last thing I wanted to know because I, you know, obviously wins and losses are not the keyest thing for the Pacers this year, especially as they've now admitted, you know, it's going to be a longer project. So he said, and this is important because I've kind of been talking about this with the player previews as well. Uh, one thing he mentioned is playing hard every game. <laughs> that certainly did not happen last year. You know, Herb Simon in the building for the Pacers giving up 150 million points to the Hornets. Uh, they were not playing hard, right? Rick Carlisle had to make them watch an entire first half right after they got smoked by the Hawks because they weren't playing hard. Playing hard every game would be an improvement over last year, and that would be one thing he defines as a successful year. But the other thing is the thing we've been talking about: guys improving, right? You can, and he likened it to like every month. You know, I, I've talked about from start to finish to end of the year. I think the Pacers will look at it a little differently in terms of every month. Okay, 
In November, Matherin, Benedict Matherin was this player. And in December, he was this player. And that's not even just statistically it's skill additions. It's how they're playing, things like that. But that's how he said he would define a successful season. And so obviously I think that that is known, given that the Pacers are younger. You know, the betting lines say they could be one of the worst teams in the league. I think the Pacers are not naive and know that. So how they define success being in line with what makes sense and not necessarily a team chasing the play and things like that is noteworthy. So – uh, yeah, that is uh, that is everything I consider noteworthy from what Kevin Pritchard had to say today. You can find articles all over the web from people who are there. Greg Doyle, like I said, Wilson Moore in the Star, Tyler Smith, I'm sure. Many sports legends will have something. Uh, Charlie Clifford from Wish. Like, there will be a lot of stories from this. I'm just thinking of people who ask questions. There are more even people not there. Evan Sidery, Basketball News. If you want to read more about this or other people's thoughts on what he had to say. Um, but, yeah, Kevin Pritchard spoke. I listened. Those are my thoughts. So, What's next here on Lockdown Pacers? Well, this was supposed to be a week where I got three player preview episodes done. I did one. <laughs> Just Miles Turner. Great timing by me. Either way, uh, next week is going to be very fluid. Very fluid. One, because I'm traveling late in the week. And two, because it's the start of the Pacers season. <laughs> Media day Monday, practice Tuesday, practice Wednesday. But I don't know how available they will be. But uh, th- they will be a lot of, you know, we can talk to players and see where the team is at. So, uh very fluid, but as it stands, it's looking like next Monday show is going to be an awesome one. Someone I've wanted to talk to and have on this podcast for a while. Uh, Kalen Cooper and I chatting about the three biggest questions for the Pacers this year. Although, as we talked, it got to more like eight or nine questions. And then Tuesday, recap of media day, big things learned from every player. I'll try to have someone who was there on to chat with me about that. Uh, and then later in the week, uh, probably would like to get the last two player preview who's <laughs> done, Tyrese Halburn and the bench forwards, before we get to October, because my goal was September for those, and then maybe another episode about what's been being said in practice, how the team looks, things like that. Maybe a little more dynamic, maybe a mailbag, if nothing completely noteworthy comes out of practice, but there's always big news that comes out of practice. Last year was that Carousel Vert had a back injury and might miss the first four games of the season, for example. You just never know. We'll have it all here you for, for you on the Locked On Pacers podcast. Thanks a ton for listening today, everybody. Hope you had a great week. We will be back Monday with something. It's all dynamic and fluid as team building goes on, as practice comes, because presumably, like we talked about with Langston Galloway uh, yesterday, you know, the the moves will be made by the Pacers, likely before training camp. If they are noteworthy or completely separate from something I've talked about, we'll cover them here. If not, we might save them for later in the week. So thank you guys a ton for listening. Have a great rest of your day, and we will see you tomorrow.